One thing I, I wanted to talk about today is uh, sort of an overview of the kind of work that we have been doing, uh, mostly from a, a quantitative point of view, uh, trying to understand um, actually overall information weaponization, which is uh, a little bit broader than uh, hate speech, although it, it definitely I includes that, uh, which is you know the terminology that I prefer to online harms, which is the preferred uh, uh, a way that uh, um, a, a lot of discussions are going on um, in government and, and, and research, because also harm sometimes some might sound a little bit um, accidental. Uh, it, it might include sort of accidental harm. Uh, so we, we tend to refer uh, to these kind of problems as information weaponization. Uh, anyway, so how does informa information get weaponized? And there is many kinds of uh, um, issues that uh, uh, there are there and that we we've been trying to to study uh, not just me personally but uh, a lot of my colleagues and uh, researchers worldwide uh, so things ranging from cyber bullying uh, and cyber aggression to uh, um, election interference uh, um, overall uh, um, coordinated efforts uh, to uh, uh, to spread uh, to sow discord to spread misinformation disinformation and so on and so forth um, so one of the things that uh, uh, really we've been trying to, to look at is to understand how the evolution of, of these things and um, um, you know um, sort of behaviors that start as you know sort of trolling and maybe uh, seemingly fun activities then you know then end up in um, um, like behaviors that are uh, actually widely recognized as uh, like hateful uh, activities. So this is an example of you know seemingly innocent frog, uh, which is actually des uh, has been labeled as a um, symbol of hate by the Anti-Defamation -Defam League. Um, so a lot of these activities actually come from uh, seemingly fringe communities like, like 4chan, um, but uh, we should be very careful in, in you know, not uh, necessarily thinking that uh, the activities on, on, on these platforms are sort of confined to a bunch of, you know, uh, crazy people or losers on you know these fringe communities because their activities do uh, spread on sort of mainstream um, and social networks and news and they actually uh, really spill out in the uh, on, on, on in the real world so really on the analog uh, world so you you we see things like coordinated hate campaigns that um, you know have deeply disturbing effects on, on on people and I can cite many examples one is Leslie Jones uh, bullied off Twitter um, and you know really their activities go all the way to the top so this is an example of a, a then candidate uh, President Donald Trump retweeting um, this sort of meme um, uh, representing him as a merge um, between him and Pepe the Frog. But again, this is this is a symbol of hate. Okay, and you know the these these sort of these uh, uh, fringe communities like 4chan have been also responsible for pushing into uh, mainstream certain conspiracy theories like Pizzagate, which was. Um, sort of a, a, a conspiracy theory stating that the Democrats and Hillary Clinton were running a pedophile uh, a ring from a pizzeria in Washington, D.C. So overall, what, what can we do, right? So there's a lot of us in, in computer science that have extensive experience with sort of mitigating unwanted activities on social networks, right? And, you know, for instance, we, we can detect blocked activity in social media, right? So um, this stuff is large scale, is often synchronized, and there's actually uh, systems that have been deployed uh, by, uh, you know, social networks or, you know, overall large, uh, in large systems, uh, Pretty much, uh, I'm oversimplifying here a little bit, but you know, pretty much um, uh, trying to uh, make d uh, automated decisions um, um, based on recognizable patterns, right? And so you see things like single trap, able cohort, botometer. You you can use these um, sort of in the real world, right? Um, but you know, what can we do really about information weaponization, right? So this is much. Uh, beyond, it goes well beyond, beyond uh, sort of bot activities for things like, you know, boosting the number of likes on your Facebook page or, you know, having more followers on Twitter than you actually 
uh, have and things like that, right? So, and one of the key components of, of, of these things is really that, uh, that there is actually a, a big human activity component. And human, human activity is, you know, by definition, less coordinated than, you know, bots and, and machines, right? So there are char characteristic traits and features that stand out much less. Um, and there is also, you know, loose synchronization. There are like com talking points that are, are common, and you know, they sort of uh, make them blend with uh, uh, with sort of regular normal uh, activity. So you know, the kind of um, overall uh, reliance on uh, sort of automated detection is a is a weak one. Okay, um, and you know another thing that comes up a lot. I mean, I, I my background is information security, so you know I've been talking about these things and collaborating with a lot of other security researchers. Is that you know we in security tend to sort of fight uh, unwanted activities on economic grounds, right? So you know take the classic example is spam. So what what you do is essentially you make it um, uh, expensive. Uh, or you know, not profitable for a spammer to target your system, right? Or or fraud. So essentially, the amount of money that they have to spend is less than the amount of money that they make. So they will move elsewhere. So they will leave your system alone, right? Uh, and so this, you know, we, we can't really use this modeling um, in information weaponization because you know, first of all, people are not motivated by uh, necessarily by sort of economic objectives, uh, and also you know, there is also a component of state level adversaries or you know large organizations that say that have deep pockets, so um, they will not be afraid to, to spend money. Um, another observation that you know sort of quickly became clear to me when I started working on this is that online services do not exist in a vacuum, and this has a deep effect on um, like understanding and countering information weaponization, right? So. Uh, you have you know social networks that influence each other and content that uh, flies from one network to to the other uh, you have content um, um, and you know media uh, traveling from one um, um, like from one platform to to the other as well as the news ecosystem is a complex one um, so a lot of of, of work um, you know, unfortunately, has been over the years sort of focused on looking at a single service at a time or one maybe kind of content at a time, um, and that's not really good enough. So we we need to move beyond this. Um, and something that I already mentioned is that there is actually sort of very small, seemingly small, fringe web communities that play a, a really a crucial role vis-a-vis uh, -vis information uh, weaponization. So, so the kind of work that we've been doing with, uh, with my colleagues, we have this sort of virtual international lab of people we call iDrama. Um, that, so essentially it's been uh, uh, designing and using computational methods to understand and mitigate information weaponization at a large scale. Um, and so we have a very qu quantitative approach and we hope to, to, to sort of form the basis for others to do case studies and qualitative work. On, on top of our infrastructures, um, where essentially we've been doing two things. One, which actually has, has really yielded a lot of, uh, of results already, uh, which is sort of data-driven analysis of, of communities. And the other one is building proactive and preventive systems to counter it. Uh, and so this is maybe more sort of ongoing work. So. I actually wanted to give, uh, um, uh, so uh, uh, first of all, an overview of the sort of various components that our work encompasses. Uh, so we have a very um, a, a big focus on on data collection, and this is actually not trivial at all. Um, in like crawling and getting data from uh, uh, platforms like 4chan, 4chan and Reddit is it's actually a, a, a big effort. Um, it's and I, I mean I can maybe talk about it. Uh, offline, what it entails, the fact that that data is ephemeral, gets deleted, so you know there is several challenges there. Um, but there's also you know sort of a, a effort to maintain uh, uh, the data collection over long spe long periods of time. So we've been collecting data for the past three and a half years. So this means also processing, cleaning, storing, indexing, uh, which is something that you know is very hard for like 
your average academic, right? So uh, we really had to go and learn uh, large-scale system deployment and so on. And then we, we rely, so we mostly rely on existing uh, uh, methodologies and technologies, although we have contributed uh, new ones, to kind of make sense of this data, right? So uh, you, you see things like uh, statistical tools, we cluster data, we do contextual analysis, language modeling, we use NLP, we use machine learning, um, and trying to do both sort of exploratory uh, kind of research. Um, a lot of it is longitudinal, like I said, we have data for like three plus years, so we can actually look back uh, quite, uh, quite, quite a lot, as well as hypothesis driven. So we have some research questions, maybe we set out some, some hypotheses and we try to, to look into that. And then, you know, uh, again, uh, and this last bit is more sort of uh, work in progress. You know, first of all, everything that we do is open source, and everything that we publish in papers, uh, both the data and the code is always available upon request. But we also kind of trying to build now an, in, an interface, essentially, to uh, help and facilitate uh, uh, qualitative and uh, qualitative and social science research uh, to perform like sort of maybe more in-depth studies of particular uh, uh, problems, right? Um, so we we hope to do to do more than that. So just as a case in point, I wanted to sort of show um, one um, sort of angle that our work has has been focused on, uh, which again uh, looks at 4chan. Uh, I don't know if you're uh, familiar with that, but you know do you, there is a lot of content that comes from 4chan, a lot of memes. A lot. It's a, Fortune is actually a big sort of internet culture kind of provider. So you, you might have heard of them in the context of memes like the lol cuts. At some point, it, it was uh, um, uh, the preferred sort of infrastructure uh, for the anonymous uh, hackers. And you know, you see these kind of memes and trolling and things like that. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, they, especially in the past maybe three, four years. Um, uh, parts of, of 4chan had really taken a turn toward the uh, uh, sort of far right and alt right, with so a lot of sort of just disturbing com content being being pushed. Uh, like I said, you know, a lot of the things um, are not confined on 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 4chan, so they've. Uh, bullied Leslie Jones of Twitter. They've turned uh, one of the very first uh, um, AI chatbots that Microsoft put out, uh, Tay, Tai, um, into like a racist thing. So like the, the the bot was sort of saying things like Hitler was great, Hitler was right, or things like that. Um, and you know they've been increasingly active in sort of political uh, battles. Right. So it's really an image board forum that is organized um, so in boards, and uh, you have sort of original posters, so people creating a new thread in this board by making a, a, a post with a single image attached. So you have to have an image in order to start a, a thread, start a, a discussion. That's also why really uh, there is a lot of content coming, uh, a lot of new content coming from, from 4chan. And uh, other users can reply with or without images and so on. So these are the boards that are active as of now, it's about 70. And one particular, one particularly interesting, quote unquote, one is poll, politically incorrect board, where there is really no moderation; everything goes. Um, so, I mean, I think the only things that get removed are things promoting their enemies, Achan, uh, and maybe child pornography. And and I underlined maybe. Okay, so um, unfortunately, so um, one key aspect is uh, two key aspects are anonymity and ephemerality. So, user, there is no account, uh, so anybody can post. Really, you just have to solve a captcha. So, there are no identifiers, um, and um, really everything gets deleted. Right, so all threads get archived after a while. There is some slightly complicated uh, sort of algorithms to de algorithm to determine uh, what thread gets deleted, but all pretty much like uh, threads die after a couple of days at most, and then they stay in some sort of uh, um, um, limbo for a week, and then they are, they are deleted. Right. So there is actually a few challenges here for us even to, uh, to, uh, uh, to study this. So first of all, it's not your typical social network. There is anonymity and ephemerality, which makes everything different and maybe more difficult. Um, I already said that. So even like t knowing what they're talking about is not easy, so you have to develop an understanding of their lingo. You might get attacked or doxxed, and this has happened to us. 
Um, so it's essentially pretty uh, a pretty intense experience. So one, as I said, case in point was um, uh, how uh, coordinated hate campaigns uh, originating from 4chan spill on mainstream platforms like YouTube. So what happens is that sometimes someone posts a YouTube link, maybe with some suggestion, you know what to do, and then the, the thread becomes an aggregation point for raiders, and then they, they sort of like congratulate each other for you know their hateful activities. So we actually measured this. Um, I don't have time to to really cover that, but I want to show like this is an example of a raid that happened to me. So I I was giving a talk and somebody asked me to put a video online. Uh, so I put that and then there was some press coverage and the link to the to YouTube was posted on 4chan and you know we got 11,000 views in like an hour, which would never happen to anybody at UCL. Um, and, and, and you see these very hateful comments here and there. So we actually have a mathematical modeling to understand the synchronization between hate happening on YouTube comments and the fact that that YouTube video was posted on, on 4chan. So it's really like a time series analysis. And you know, just for, for to, to, to show you like how things are correlated, so this doesn't work, you see that most, most uh, hateful comments happen sort of right after uh, uh, the video, a link to the video is posted on 4chan. So can we detect this? Yes, and can we even predict? So now one of the our recent results was trying to put a, place, put a system in place where we can actually identify videos that are likely to be, to be targeted. Um, and so this prompts like a, an interesting discussion, I hope, about you know, what can we do about this? So can platforms decide to dedicate resources and moder or moderation uh, for, for this kind of thing? So I think this is one of the things I would like, <laughs> I would like to, to discuss. Anyway, so I hope I, I finished in time. Yes, All right, thank you very much. Uh, thanks. Thank you.